NVIDIA's CEO just said something that should make every investor, tech enthusiast, and business leader stop and reconsider everything they think they know about the AI revolution happening right now. When asked about the company's $2 billion financing deal with XAI and similar arrangements with OpenAI, Jensen Huang didn't defend the strategy or deflect concerns about circular financing. He said his only regret about investing in these AI companies is that he didn't give them more money, not less, more. In an industry where CEOs typically hedge, qualify, and carefully manage expectations, that statement is remarkable. But what's even more revealing is what came next. His explanation of why this AI build-out is fundamentally different from the dot-com bubble why AI tokens have just crossed a profitability threshold that changes everything, and why he believes we don't need artificial general intelligence for AI to justify the trillions of dollars currently being invested in infrastructure. This isn't hype from a company trying to sell chips. This is the perspective of someone sitting at the intersection of every major AI development, financing billions in infrastructure, and watching the economics shift in real time. Here's what NVIDIA's CEO actually said about where AI is heading, why the comparison to the dot-com crash misses the point entirely, and what shift from token generation at a loss to profitable AI services means for the next phase of this transformation. The question that's haunting Wall Street right now is whether we're witnessing a sustainable technological revolution or an infrastructure bubble that will collapse like telecom equipment makers Lucent and Nortel did in the early 2000s. The concern is straightforward. NVIDIA is providing vendor financing to help AI companies buy the very chips NVIDIA manufactures. When your customers can't afford your products without your financial help, that starts looking like the circular financing schemes that preceded previous tech crashes. Bloomberg reported $2 billion in financing arrangements with XAI, following similar deals with OpenAI. The pattern raises obvious red flags. Is NVIDIA creating artificial demand by lending money to companies that use those loans to buy NVIDIA products? When pressed on this comparison to the dot-com era, Wang's response was immediate and specific. First, he addressed XAI directly. I'm super excited about the financing opportunity. The only regret I have about XAI, we're an investor already. The only regret I have is I didn't give him more money. Almost everything that Elon's part of, you really want to be part of. That's not just corporate diplomacy, that's a CEO saying he wishes he'd taken a bigger stake in companies he's also financing chip purchases for. But then came the more substantive defense of why this isn't a repeat of 2000. What's going on in the world versus what happened in 2000 is just dramatically different, Huang explained. Back then, if you recall, there were Pets.com, hospitals, and all of the internet companies combined was, what, 30 to 40 billion dollars in size. The comparison he's drawing is critical. During the dot-com bubble, massive infrastructure investment was being made to serve companies with minimal revenue, unproven business models, and a total addressable market, measured in tens of billions. The entire internet economy was smaller than many individual companies today. If you look at the hyperscalers now, that's where the first tranche of AI infrastructure is building. The hyperscalers have about $2.5 trillion of business that's already operating today. He's talking about Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, and similar massive cloud infrastructure providers. These aren't speculative startups. They're established businesses generating hundreds of billions in annual revenue. That $2.5 trillion business and the capex that goes underneath that is about $500 billion. That transition from classical CPU-based computing to now generative AI computing powered by GPU-S, that transition is just starting. This is the key distinction. The infrastructure being built isn't for hypothetical future demand. It's replacing and expanding existing infrastructure that already serves a $2.5 trillion market We've got to build into half a trillion dollars worth of capacity infrastructure that's already naturally growing by itself. And we're in the beginning phases of that. If you just look at NVIDIA's AI infrastructure business, call it a couple hundred billion dollars so far. We're a couple hundred billion dollars into a multi-trillion dollar build-out. But there's a second dimension to his argument that's even more important for understanding where this is heading. We have a new generation of AI companies. The new AI companies like OpenAI and Anthropic and XAI and companies like Safe Superintelligence from Ilya Sutskever and Reflection 
there's a whole bunch of amazing AI model builders now. What's changed with these companies, according to Huang, is the economics. For the last several years, they've been generating tokens, these AI tokens, basically at a loss. And the reason for that is because the early AI models weren't, they were super interesting, really captivated a lot of attention, but they weren't useful enough to pay for. This is the admission that should have been getting more attention. The foundational economics of AI companies were underwater until very recently. They were generating responses, conversations, and content, but the value produced didn't justify the computational costs. The last several months has been very clear that the new technology is now reasoning. It's doing research before it answers a question. It goes on the web and studies other PDFs and websites. It can now use tools, generate information for you, and it creates responses that are really useful. I use it every day to the point where now the tokens are profitable. This is the inflection point he's identifying. AI has crossed from impressive but economically unsustainable to profitable per interaction. That's a fundamental shift that changes the investment thesis entirely. The interviewer pushed back with the obvious question, who's actually going to pay for all this infrastructure long term? Is it large enterprises like Procter and Gamble? Is it consumers subscribing to CHATGPT? The uncertainty around customer willingness to pay remains genuine. Huang's response focused on enterprise adoption as the economic engine. The thing that's really cool is that the enterprise AI build-out that's happening now. My favorite enterprise AI service is Cursor. Cursor is an AI coder, and every one of our engineers, 100%, is now assisted by AI coders. And our productivity has gone up incredibly. This isn't theoretical future adoption. It's what's happening inside NVIDIA right now. You're now seeing enterprise AI companies like Cursor, Open Evidence, Lovable, all of these companies are some of the fastest growing companies in the world, and they address enterprise. And so enterprise AI is here. The economic model he's describing is fundamentally different from consumer adoption. When enterprise software demonstrably increases productivity, businesses pay for it at scale. If AI coding assistants genuinely make 40,000 NVIDIA engineers more productive, that has measurable ROI that justifies subscription costs. That's a very different economic foundation than consumer curiosity or novelty value. But there's a bigger question haunting all of this. What's the end game? A Sequoia Capital partner recently wrote that only achieving artificial general intelligence, AGI, meaning AI that can perform any intellectual task a human can, could justify the volumes of capital being spent right now. Meanwhile, many AI researchers are pushing out their timelines for when AGI might be achievable. NVIDIA is releasing new chip generations annually, which means rapid depreciation of expensive infrastructure. Are we building towards something real or just running on a treadmill of endless upgrades? Huang's answer to this is probably the most important part of the entire interview. We are going to have incredibly profitable and incredibly useful AIs long before AGI. This directly challenges the premise that AGI is necessary for the investment to make sense. Right now, Cursor AI, Cursor is an AI software coder, is incredibly useful. All of our engineers use it. We have some 40,000 engineers. Almost every one of them are going to use it, and they're loving it. The interviewer pressed, they're using it instead of something else, presumably. Huang's response reveals a crucial distinction. No, this is a brand new thing. AI, unlike previous technologies, Previous technologies are tools that humans use. Excel is a tool that humans use. A web browser is a tool that humans use. For the very first time, we have technology that can actually use tools by itself. This is the conceptual shift he's emphasizing. Previous software required human operators. AI can operate software autonomously. Cursor uses Visual Studio C++. And now we have Gemini agents that are able to use the browser and browse for groceries or destinations or book travel for you. And it can use tools by itself. So this is really quite an extraordinary thing. This tool user industry, the tool industry is a few trillion dollars. Tool user industries, $100 trillion. The economic argument he's making is that AI isn't just a new type of software tool adding to the existing software market. It's a technology that can perform labor, which is a market 20 to 30 times larger than software tools. Which is the reason why everybody's so excited about the future of technology. Because it could augment labor, it can increase the productivity of labor. And here at NVIDIA, it's increased our productivity tremendously. If this assessment is accurate, then the relevant comparison isn't the dot-com bubble, it's the industrial revolution. 
where new technologies fundamentally changed the productivity of human labor rather than just creating new categories of consumer products. The interviewer then shifted to the competitive dynamics. Sam Altman at OpenAI talks about sprinting to stay ahead because there won't be room for everyone. Does Huang think the market will consolidate to a few winners, or is there room for many players? His answer reveals how he thinks about market structure. I think there's general intelligence, and I think there's specialized intelligence. We love general. When I hire engineers, I like them to be generally intelligent. That's a great thing. But once they come to NVIDIA, we make them highly specialized, intelligent, so that they could build things that NVIDIA needs. And so I think the idea of specialized intelligence versus generalized intelligence will continue to happen. And where the real value for enterprises and companies is specialized intelligence, and where the value for consumers is general intelligence. This suggests he sees the market splitting. Consumer-facing general AI, like ChatGPT, may consolidate to a few dominant players, but enterprise-focused specialized AI will fragment into many vertical-specific solutions. That would support continued demand for infrastructure across many players rather than winner-take-all consolidation. Finally, the conversation turned to capital allocation, how NVIDIA is choosing to deploy its massive cash flows. The company is increasingly making direct investments in AI companies, which raises questions about whether they're prioritizing venture investments over R&D, acquisitions, or shareholder returns. We're always looking for great startups to invest in. One of my favorite ones was CoreWeave. My only regret is I didn't invest enough. And so in all of these investments that we've made recently, we've made some really terrific investments. And largely, my only regret is that we didn't invest more, because they're really special companies, and they're building. They're part of our ecosystem, building out the AI infrastructure for the world. This reveals the strategic logic. NVIDIA isn't just selling chips to these companies. They're taking equity stakes in the infrastructure layer being built on top of their hardware, effectively creating leveraged exposure to the AI build-out. If the thesis is correct and we're in the early stages of a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure replacement cycle, these equity stakes could be worth multiples of the chips sold. AI is several things. AI is energy, AI is chips, the models, and the applications. And so you could see NVIDIA working across that entire stack of ecosystems around the world. And we need more energy. We need more chips. We need better models. What emerges from this conversation is a CEO who genuinely believes we're at the beginning of a decades-long infrastructure build-out, not the end of a hype cycle. Whether he's right or caught in the same bubble vision that affected telecom executives in 1999 won't be clear for years. But the specifics matter. The shift from unprofitable to profitable AI tokens, the distinction between tool industries and tool user industries, the focus on enterprise adoption with measurable productivity gains, and the argument that useful AI doesn't require AGI to justify investment. These are testable claims that will either validate or refute the current spending levels over the next few years. The only certainty is that NVIDIA is placing enormous bets, and its CEO's only regret is that those bets aren't even bigger. What emerges from this conversation is a CEO who genuinely believes we're at the beginning of a decades-long infrastructure build-out, not the end of a hype cycle. Whether he's right or caught in the same bubble vision that affected telecom executives in 1999 won't be clear for years but the specifics matter. The shift from unprofitable to profitable AI tokens, the distinction between tool industries and tool user industries, the focus on enterprise adoption with measurable productivity gains, and the argument that useful AI doesn't require AGI to justify investment. These are testable claims that will either validate or refute the current spending levels over the next few years. The only certainty is that NVIDIA is placing enormous bets, and its CEO's only regret is that those bets aren't even bigger.